No matter what else is happening in the world. There is always good news today. Welcome to Good News Today, the program where you will always find good news no matter what else is happening in the world. I'm Mark Teske, your host for Good News Today. I want to thank you for joining us. We've got a great lineup. Let me tell you what's coming up. We're going to begin with our devotional time, as we always do, and that consists of our scripture reading, beautiful singing, and then a brief study of that scripture. Today we'll be looking at Philippians chapter 1, verses 9 through 11, a passage where the Apostle Paul prays for the church there in Philippi, and in that prayer he gives some important instructions to a congregation that's already doing great. Get out your Bibles, turn to Philippians 1. I'll meet you there in just a moment. Following our devotional time, Troy Spradlin's going to join us from his workshop, and he'll be repairing our understanding about true worship. Jim Dearman has got some sound words for us today about the greatest discipline. We'll see what that's about in just a few moments. Then Roger Campbell joins us, and he looks at what it means to be in Christ. There's a lot to it, that's for sure. And in our final segment, we have a Bible question for Guyton Montgomery and Troy Spradlin. Where was Jesus while his body was in the grave? That's a very interesting question, and they'll be looking at what the Bible says about that. As you can see, there's much Bible and much teaching in today's episode. Well, I hope you have your Bibles opened up to Philippians chapter 1 where we read beginning at verse number 9. And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment, that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God.
Paul's letter to the Philippians was one of the letters that he wrote from prison after he appealed to Caesar because of his uh, Roman citizenship. We read about that in Acts chapter 25, verse 11. The interesting thing about the book of Philippians is even though Paul was in jail, one of the main themes of this book is joy. Rejoicing is a common theme that we see within the letter to the Philippians. Kind of special about this letter is he's not fixing any doctrinal problems they have at the congregation. For the most part, things are going great there. Now, there's a couple of sisters that were having some disagreements, and Paul does address that, but that's as bad as it gets. This is really a good letter to a congregation that's doing well. And our passage that we're looking at today, chapter 1, verses 9 through 11, Paul's praying for them that their love may abound more and more. That word for love, that's agape love. That's a decision type love. I've make it, made a decision to do what's in somebody else's best interest. It's not a mushy-gushy feeling. It's a decision that I want what's best for them. He says that type of love needs to abound more and more. That comes down to giving more than just enough, going above and beyond, going that extra mile, making a decision that I'm not just going to do the bare minimum. I'm going to do as much as I possibly can as I show that love, that decision for what's best for somebody else. It's a very giving heart. That's a love that Paul's praying for here. But he also tells us that love is going to be filled with all knowledge and discernment. It's kind of interesting, this word for knowledge uh, is, is not a standard level of knowledge, but it has that uh, preface to the word epi, above and beyond. This is a, a very deep understanding. You know, we can know somebody very superficially, or we can know somebody very deeply. And this is that deep understanding. Also, discernment, clearly perceiving the true nature of something. So we have this deep understanding and truly understanding and perceiving its true nature. You see, this knowledge and discernment is taking that love of somebody else and bringing it to a much deeper level because we know them, because we know their true nature so very well. But it doesn't stop there with just knowing somebody else, but he goes on to talk about the way they are to behave. And he concludes that with looking at them being filled with the fruits of righteousness. He's praying that their lives will be filled with the effects of living a life of doing what is right what God's Word teaches. That's a great way to live life and a reason to be a Christian because your life is going to be filled with these pleasant effects, the fruits of righteousness, from, from living a life of, of doing just what God said to do. You know, His commands to us are not arbitrary. They're not burdensome. He's not trying to keep us away from all the fun. You see, His commands are trying to help us do what's right, what's in our best interest, long term. Because you see, from God's perspective, He sees all the trouble that man gets themselves into through doing these things that He calls sin. Don't do it. Obey these things I've commanded to you, and you're going to have a life filled with these fruits. And what's the whole purpose of this? Conclusion there in verse 11, to glorify and praise God. All these blessings are to praise Him, to glorify Him, to focus on Him, not for us, but for Him. As we seek to make application from this passage to this congregation that was doing so well, 
don't rest on, don't rest on your laurels. Don't say, I've done well enough, and leave it at that. Continue to grow. Continue to abound. Continue to develop in your Christianity. Love more. Love those who hate you, who persecute you, who despise you. Jesus commanded this back in the Sermon on the Mount. That same type of love. A decision that I want what's in their best interest. We can all grow in our love toward those who hate us and persecute us and despise us. In addition, we need to love more deeply. We also need to study and grow in our knowledge. It's one thing to just study, but we need to change our lives, take some effort and commitment. But by growing and producing fruit, we can glorify God. And that is good news for us today. Now, Troy Spradlin comes to us from his workshop as he repairs our understanding about worship. Whether we want to accept it or not, all of mankind is a creature of worship. We're going to worship something. And worship simply means to, to bow down before, to give reference and honor to someone or something. And many religious-minded people bow down before God the Father in Christian worship, while others bow down at the altar of false gods, idols, or ideologies. And still others, who are more worldly, well, they worship things like money, politics, fame, science, or they have their own personal tenet. The fact is, we're all creatures of worship. You know, as a Christian, have you ever given much consideration to preparation or entering into worship? Are you the type that just shows up at the appointed time and then respectfully waits for it to end so you can get back to other things in your life? Or do you consciously look forward to the occasion, making special preparations for it, then actively participating in worship with joy and thanksgiving? You see, there is a distinction between the two. And this is a very important matter to consider. Because Jesus explained in John chapter 4, verse 23, He said, But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship Him. You see, God desires true worshipers to come into His presence. So what is true worshiping? What is that? Well, let's repair our understanding by considering a few questions regarding our worship. Number one, do you recognize that God is the audience and not you? You know, our Western culture has become so accustomed to attending entertainment venues where the seating is arranged to face in one direction, usually a, a central focal point like a stage. We then passively expect the person or the thing and that focal point to entertain us. But that's not how worship works. Yes, we have seats set up and a stage, but it is us that is being observed. We are the performers, if you will, because we are there for God's purposes, not for our own. It isn't about entertainment for us. It's about bringing honor and glory to Him, our Creator. And understanding this will greatly affect your attitude towards worship. Number two, are you observing the commands and patterns for worship? You know, the New Testament church in the first century demonstrated a very clear pattern for worship. Through inspiration, God gave very specific commands about what is acceptable worship, just like He did the Jews in the old law. We are to sing and to pray, to preach, to, to give, and the central part of worship is participation in the Lord's Supper. And all of this takes place on the first day of the week. We have no authority to add to or change this pattern or this doctrine for worship. And this is how we worship in truth. And number three, do you see it as a family gathering? You know, the word church comes from a Greek word, ekklesia, which means assembly or congregation. Church isn't something we go to. It is who we are. We are the assembly or the body of Christ, as it says in Colossians 1.18. It is described as a family in Ephesians 2.19. Worship of the first century Christians involved brothers and sisters in Christ congregating together 
to carry out the five acts and aspects of worship to God. See, God desires His family to assemble to worship Him, just like we'll do when we're in heaven. So on the day of worship, ask yourself these questions in order to see if you are prepared as a true worshiper. If the answer to these is yes, then you will be pleasing to God and to Him be the glory. Thanks, Troy. It's time to grab a piece of paper and something to write with so you can take down our contact information. You can use it to enroll in our free Bible correspondence course. It's graded by one of the excellent volunteers. They do a great job and we appreciate them. After that, Jim Dearman's going to be with us. You may have questions or comments about Good News Today. We'd like to hear from you. Or if you would like to receive free Bible study materials, please contact us. Our mailing address is Good News Today, P.O. Box 206, Dunlap, Tennessee, 37327. Again, that's Good News Today, P.O. Box 206, Dunlap, Tennessee, 37327. You may prefer to email us at goodnewstodaytv at gmail.com. That's goodnewstodaytv at gmail.com. Or call us toll free at 1-877-384-7221. That's 1-877-384-7221. We'd like to hear from you. Hearing from our audience is always good news to us. You can enroll in the Bible Correspondence Course right from our website or watch any of over 1,500 videos on demand right there as well. The address is gntv.org. You can also hear good news today on Truth.fm, which is a group of internet radio stations streaming 24-7. They have a channel there that plays nothing but good news today, and you can listen anytime you'd like. They also have several other excellent channels. Remember, the truth is always being preached at Truth.fm. Now here's Jim Dearman with some sound words about discipline. We will live eternally if we obey sound words. A teacher told her student, Billy, this is the fifth time this week I've had to discipline you. What do you have to say for yourself? Billy replied, I'm glad it's Friday. <laughs> you know, it may be that such an incident would have been more prevalent years ago than now in our schools and in our homes. This is the age in which everything is controlled by a switch except the children. Yet one of the wisest men who ever lived advised long ago, do not withhold correction from a child, for if you beat him with a rod, he will not die. You shall beat him with a rod and deliver his soul from hell. Proverbs 23, 13 and 14. The greatest discipline is that which brings up the child in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. How are you doing as a parent in that regard? We will live eternally if we obey sound words. Those are some great thoughts that every parent needs to hear. If you'd like to share that message with others, you can find it on our website or on our apps. Apps are available for your phone or tablet as well as Roku and Apple TV. Just look for Good News Today in the App Store and download it there for free. Now Roger Campbell is going to explain to us what it means to be in Christ. Be ready always. As a Christian, God wants you and me to be ready to give a defense or, or give an answer. In the New Testament, we often read the two words, in Christ. What's so special? about being in the Christ. How would you use the scriptures to answer that question? Well, in general language, the Bible tells us in Ephesians 1 and verse 3 that God has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. And so God's arrangement by His wisdom is for all spiritual blessings to be in His Son. We're familiar with the language of Romans 3 and verse 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But what does the next verse say? Romans 3 and verse 24, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in 
Christ Jesus. So, so redemption, that state of being bought back to the Lord, our redemption is in the Christ. Staying in that same book of Romans chapter 8 and verse number 1, there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So in the Christ, there is a state of no condemnation. What about being a new creature? New creatures are all where? That's right, in the Christ. The verse is 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And so as we keep working through the New Testament, what do we see? Ephesians 1 and verse 7. In reference to Jesus, the Bible says, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. And so because of God's great grace, through Jesus' blood, we have what? We have redemption or the forgiveness of sin. In the book of 2 Timothy chapter 2, and verse number 1, we read that Paul exhorted Timothy to be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Where is God's grace available? In His Son. And then one final verse we'll mention would be 1 John chapter 5 and verse 11. There we learn that God gives eternal life, and this life, eternal life, is where? It's in His Son. What's special about being in Jesus? We have all of those spiritual blessings that we just mentioned. We have redemption. We have forgiveness. We are a born-again person. We're a new creation. No condemnation. We have eternal life. We have God's grace. What would be a really important follow-up question? How does one get into the Christ? And there's one Bible answer that's given. It's given in two verses, Galatians 3.27 and Romans 6.3. And the answer is, after one has heard and believes the gospel, one gets into the Christ by being baptized into him. Those who have not yet obeyed the gospel, they're without God, without Christ, and without hope. And so we encourage you today, friend, if you've not obeyed the gospel, do it today so you can enjoy those great riches that God has in Christ. I'm Roger Kennedy, and this has been Be Ready Always. Thanks, Roger. With all those blessings, it's critically important that we be in Christ and remain in Christ. One tool that can help you be in Christ is our podcast. Every morning, Good News Today daily devotional time gets released. Start your day with a dose of good news and spend time in the Scriptures. We'll have a Bible question for Guyton and Troy in just a moment. Troy, I got a good question for you today. <laughs> you always do. <laughs> I like this one. Where was the spirit of Jesus while his body was in the grave? Wow, that's an interesting question. Well, first and foremost, when you go to Matthew chapter 27, verse 50, it talks about, you know, that Jesus gave up his spirit. Mm -hmm. And we know that this, we've talked about this before, how the spirit leaves the body. Exactly. And so now you have to go back to the scriptures to see some things. Now I will say this, there's a lot of confusion oh, about this 
when it comes to passages like first Peter chapter three, verse 18 through 20, that talks about Christ suffered once for sins and just for the unjust that he might bring us to God being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit by whom he also went and preached to the spirits in prison. And a lot of people interpret that as well. Jesus went to hell or went down into the Hadean realm or something like that and preach to those people. He spent three days preaching. In fact, there's a doctrine called the weekend in hell, which is a false doctrine. Yeah. And th- that doesn't really match what we know about the idea of the Hadean realm anyway. Exactly. I mean, well, first of all, the context of that passage says who formerly were disobedient when once long suffering God waited the days of Noah. This is, this is a context thing. It's not Jesus preaching. And what good would that preaching do whenever you, I think I know where you're going with this verse. Oh, you do. You do. Luke, Luke 16. Yes. You know, we've talked about that a lot of times because you have the rich man uh, and Lazarus and both of them die. One goes to the place of torment. The other one goes to the place uh, of, uh, Ab- that's called Abraham's bosom. But they're both the Hadean realm. Right. And, and it's pretty much what we've said on the show before. It's like a waiting place, a waiting room. Yes. That we we know generally what the the outcome of the judgment day is going to be because those that are righteous are in Abraham's bosom. Those that are lost would be uh, in the place of torment because we know Jesus had no sin. We believe he was would be in Abraham's bosom, the same place that Lazarus's spirit went while he was waiting. And so, but the difference is he arose. Exactly. In fact. Peter said that in Acts chapter 2, verse 31, he says, Foreseeing this spoke concerning the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. So where was Jesus? Well, Peter gives us the answer. He was in the same place that he preached about in Luke chapter 16. Yeah, and and this brings us a lot of hope. I love this because it fits in several, like the saints in the book of Revelation crying out from under the altar, how long, Mm -hmm. how long? Mm -hmm. And the fact that Jesus' soul did not stay stay in Abraham's bosom or his spirit. Instead, it, he, he rose in first Corinthians 15. We're going to be like him because he was the first fruit. Yes. Amen. This may strike you as odd, but we don't want you to believe us. We want you to check what we've taught in this program against the word of God and see if these things are so. If you need to hear it again, you can go to our website, to our apps, to our Roku channel or our podcast, and you can hear the message again. If you have any questions, contact us. We'd love to answer your question. We may even answer it on the program. Remember that we love you, we are praying for you, and we want you to make it to heaven. All around the world, news, good news, always good news, good news, good news, there is good news today. Good news, good news, around the world, always good news. Good news, good news, there is good news today. All around the world, good news, good news, always good news. Good news, good news, there is good news today.